As of recording this, the 2024 Australian Featherweight National Robot Combat event is just over a week away, which I am competing with my first robot in the class named Arrive. It's a scaled up version of my 150 gram machine of the same name. The 13.6 kilogram robot uses both a lifting arm and spinning weapon to control and damage opponents. Ideally this combination should keep an opponent perpetually unstable and not give them a chance to react. This is part 2 of the journey to compete at this level, so watch that if you want to know more details, but I'll give a quick rundown here. Following a several year design process, we've arrived at this machine. Using a 52 volt power system based on electric skateboard technology, the robot uses no gearboxes on the drivetrain to save weight, though there is one in the lifting arm. This gearbox drives a chain and sprocket to raise and lower the hardened steel forks, which can comfortably deadlift 15 kilograms, though it took some iteration to make it reliable enough for combat. That was the state the robot was in last time. Now was to get it functionally complete and ready for competition, with the first order of business being to machine and test the hopefully destructive spinning weapon. To make weight for two independent weapons, the spinner on this machine is pretty small, so some smarts are required to ensure it hits as hard as possible. I found the same problem with my 150 gram version of the robot, that this was mitigated with good geometry, a high spinning speed and forks to bring the opponent up to the optimal level. The faster the weapon spins, the more energy it stores, and as kinetic energy goes up with the square of speed, this can dramatically increase the damage potential. Energy is again only damage potential, the weapon needs a good geometry to deliver it. The disc has a single tooth to maximise engagement. Think of throwing something at a spinning saw blade compared to a ceiling fan at the same speed. The fewer the teeth, the more energy is imparted because the object travels further into the path of the impactor before engagement. Importantly, the tooth is swept back or has a negative rake to pull and rip a target like an end mill shaving material off during a cut. Finally, the robot's forks are key to lifting an opponent up to be as normal to the spinner as possible, that is perpendicular to the path of the tooth. This further increases the chance of engaging the underside of a hard edge and typically a golden ticket to a good bite. Two discs make up the 1.5 kilograms allotted for the weapon and flank either side of the power transmitting belt, protecting it from external hits. The disc needs to be very strong, hard enough to not deform on impacts, but not too hard that it shatters. A strategy is to have a soft aluminium bar or disc with a hard impactor, but for maximum durability I spec the whole disc to be made of Hardox 550. I have milled harder steels on my CNC milling machine before, but these weapons needed so much material removed it will take close to an actual full day to machine the pair, likely burning through my end mills. Luckily for me though, I get permission to run my parts through the much larger milling machine at work. This Hartford HV35 was built in 1990 hasn't been changed much by the owner since, besides hacking the paper tape program reader to feed it commands from a computer via serial. What it may lack in silicon it makes up with iron. At 4.5 tonnes it's 10 times the mass of my machine, which will come into play later. Besides the sheer mass and rigidity, the spindle is also considerably more powerful and the enclosure with flood cooling can keep the cutting tool as lubricated and chip cleared as possible. After loading in the plate stock, we could run the program and mostly sit back. Due to the high hardness and strength of the material we were cutting, we were limited in speed by the end mill. If we pushed it too hard, it would fail and I didn't have a spare. They typically break after an hour or two on my machine, so hopes were not high but making through both discs. Most of the operations were boring, where the tool uses the bottom of the flutes to cut material. These are pretty safe, as the tool is very strong axially, but some holes were small in diameter and deep. For the 10mm pin holes, we had to switch to a 6mm tool, which demonstrates another cool function of the machine, a tool changing turret. What did we get? Amazing. 
After trying to remove it percussively, the tabs were cut with an angle grinder and finished on the bench grinder, as can't do much to this material without carbide tooling or high speed abrasion. With the 8mm end mill still intact, we set the second program underway, though it was making a lot more noise, as at this point the teeth had pretty much worn out. It either explodes here or it finishes here after it. Well, it's close enough, you could just punch the, the rest yeah. out. <laughs> Unless it gets jammed in there permanently. Welds the carbide to the hole. I know. What do you say to this operation? What's your opinion? Yeah, it's disgusting. 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 Eventually, I had both discs, which felt very sturdy. Surprisingly, the one 8mm end mill did both parts successfully, though the teeth are badly chipped. It's earned an early retirement on the trophy and trinket shelf for its service. I reckon the reason it lasted so long was that big mill was so rigid and heavy, it dampened the micro vibrations that lead to early tool wear something my tour mark is much less good at. The bearing bore needed some grinding to get to just the right diameter, but soon it was a good fit. The 10mm pins were shoulder bolts with the heads and threads cut off. Similar to the discs, the weapon axle is a piece of specially treated steel. 20mm in diameter, the 1045 shaft is induction hardened to a very high degree. It's actually visible. You can see it here where the texture changes as the case hardened section ends. This makes it very good for running bearings on, as the surface is unlikely to wear or the shaft to bend, though at this increased risk of cracking. A second cool machine used for this project is the Big Work Lathe, put to use here again for its rigidity, as it's much appreciated for working on hardened steels. Even if the peak cutting forces are within the smaller machine's capabilities, tiny amounts of deflection can be greater than the tool cutting depth and cause failure, but that's a topic for another time. The shaft is faced to length and drilled through as the centre material contributes very little to the bending and buckling stiffness of the parts for the weight, a common and useful technique for shafts or members under bending or axial loads. For tapping threads in the end of the shaft, this lathe has a cool feature. The chuck is connected to the gearbox with an oil clutch, which can drive the spindle both directions by a sort of variable torque as it slips up to speed. This means it has fine torque and speed control and can thus tap threads safely or if the spindle was directly connected to the gearbox, for this it will pretty much just destroy the tapping tool more or less instantly. To power the weapon, we need a pulley system for the motor. Pulleys are machined from aluminium, and then somehow I screw up the tooth profile and immediately move to running the tooth belt backwards as a flat friction belt on smooth pulleys. This genuinely is never a problem. Due to calculation problems, it takes more than a few attempts to get the size of the pulley right, but soon enough we have a spinning unit. I can't safely test the weapon without all the guts in the robot though, so much late night wiring ensued. With all systems connected, we could set up for a full function test. The robot drives really well, just gliding along the ground quietly, as there are no gears in the system, though the furniture caster wheels are very slippy, so I'd like to oversteer. Next is a proper lifter test, which did just fine with the improvements knocked out in the last video. We reckon this rail iron weighed about 15 kilograms, so it's a good test mass. <laughs> Very nice. Hold on. Finally, we check the weapon, with the robot up on blocks, so it can't drive off and hit something if it does spin up. Something ready? I'll investigate. Not working, it turns out there was a broken sensor wire leading to the motor. Quick fix, and back on the blocks. Looking good, but sounding pretty slow. We'll have to investigate that later. But for now we get a run up at a wooden beam for a fairly safe test hit. With it working well enough for a photo shoot, I needed to improve the electrics situation. Everything was way too tight and the center stuff was pushing into the path of the lifter mechanics. The drive and lifter pulled so little current it was sensible to make some modifications to the motor controllers. I pulled the heatsink off the back and replaced the power wires with thinner 16 gauge instead of the stock 12 gauge. The weapon ESC was left alone though, as it's going to be dumping a lot of current continuously. Combined with just a general tidy and thinner wire, this gave space for foam padding with proper insulation and strain relief on all the wires. I could now, for the first time, drive, lift and spin all at the same time.
Derive had been using bored out plastic furniture caster wheels until now, which were far from delivering the traction I wanted. I had made custom polyurethane wheels for my 150 gram ant robots, so decided to scale up the process. Hubs were printed out of TPU plastic with ABS bushings and moulds. The latter would be cut off once the wheel sets. The resin is a two part solution that needs to have air pulled out of it for the best results, leading to some neat visuals with the vacuum chamber. up and then it'll collapse down. See? There we go. There. And once it collapses back down, yeah. Pretty good. So you've got to hold it for a minute, I think. Put stuff on top, hopefully that's okay. Oh, oh no, slow down. <laughs> straight in, bully. Oh, I can cut that out, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he says. Cool. Definitely going to have to do two or three rounds of that one. The wheels took 48 hours to properly set, after which they got a quick test drive. The increased traction was very apparent, basically no sliding about, and it's far easier to go to a position instead of just a direction. Thinking back to throwing around the test mass, the robot toppling forward isn't ideal. I modelled up some longer forks to hopefully mitigate this in the future, with an extra set to try out. The machine is 800 grams underweight, which left enough to model a horizontal configuration with small wedgie pontoons. That's more or less the state of the robot at the moment. I'll need to find somewhere to hit a hard object to better test the weapon, but it's more a matter of smashing out spare parts. If you're interested in more combat robot projects, I have other videos on this channel documenting some of their builds and competitions. Otherwise, until next time.